Welcome, friends, to yet another episode of uh, Gender Equality Talks in the lead-up to the International Conference on Family Planning, ICFP 2022. Today, we have a very special guest, uh, especially because we uh, are not fortunate enough to listen to a lot of ground voices from the Pacific. And uh, we have Professor Glenn Mola, who is from Papua New Guinea and represents the Papua New Guinea Obstetrics and Gynecology Society. Professor Glenn Mola is the head of obstetrics and gynecology at the School of Medicine and Health Sciences and Port Morris Bay General Hospital in Papua New Guinea. So welcome, Professor Glenn Mola. We are very honored and very privileged to uh, have you amongst us, uh, especially knowing um, the very important life-saving and healing work which you are doing in the hospital uh, academics and research, as well as the challenges with internet and in the context of Papua New Guinea. So extremely grateful that um, you have found time for us. So welcome, Professor Glenn Mola. Before, uh, you know, uh, without any further ado, let us straight dive into the main uh, issue. And uh, I will really request you to kindly give us an overview and help us understand uh, the successes and challenges of family planning, sexual and reproductive health and rights in context of Papua New Guinea. Over to you, Professor Mon. It's been very difficult to even provide supervised birthing care. And we've been stuck at that um, at about a 40% proportion for the last 25 years. Fa family planning really has to be integrated with other care you can't well, we, we can't seem to to mount a, a credible family planning project just as an isolated issue um, and uh, so family planning has also been stuck at quite uh, in the mid to, mid to high 20 percent contraceptive prevalence rates for the last um, 20 years or so um, one bright spot or success you might say um, that we've um, found um, a strategy recently that we've instituted immediate postpartum uh, family planning programs, mainly with the contraceptive implant and uh, and postpartum sterilization. We do tubal uh, tubal sterilization. That's all this. All the counselling we've done is uh, is done antenatally, so that when the woman comes to have her supervised birth, then she's ready or uh, all set, as it were, for either getting. Or um, having her postpartum sterilization, tubal ligation. So we do quite a few vasectomies as well in those circumstances. Um, and of course, the vasectomy we recommend for before the birth, actually, because the women, our women are having their uh, are having their um, family completion. Um, usually, one more baby than they were actually wanting to have. Our, um, our demographic health survey shows very clearly. Every 10 years we do it and we find the equal family size is always about one more than the, uh, less I should say, one, the ideal family size is one less. Anyway, the implant programs have been very successful indeed. Um, the main problem them is um, rumors about um, side effects or something or bad, bad of the implant. Papua New Guineans, I suppose, not just Papua New Guineans, but women or people all over the world seem to the idea of spreading misinformation. We saw this with COVID and COVID vaccination. Um, so many conspiracy theories and misconceptions being propagated in the community and also with family planning. But uh, we, we do our very, very best to counsel and re-counsel when women come requesting removal of their implants after just a couple of months because of something they've heard in the community that the implant will cause them to get cancer or the implant will cause them to um, have problems with their husband or with their in-laws or, or they'll go to hell instead of heaven if they have an implant, all sorts of um, misconceptions in the community that we have to deal with to try and keep our implant program successful. Right, right. Thank you so much for this overview, Professor Mullah. And uh, I totally agree with you. The hesitancy or uh, to vaccines and misconceptions and myths are also in India. And, uh, you know, where we're right. um, speaking from, totally agree. But of course, like context and things might be very different too. So, um, and, um, and way more challenging in context of Papua New Guinea. 
So, yes. uh, so, uh, sir, sir, what what are your insights on, sir? How can we tackle this more? How can we avoid? How can people in Papua New Guinea avoid unintended pregnancy? As you said, uh, they, uh, that is, is continues to be a challenge, uh, and other family planning, uh, you know. Yes. So, you I, so, 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 yeah. So I started off by emphasizing the importance of integrating family planning into um, all sorts of healthcare, not just maternal healthcare, for heaven's sake. And uh, unless we can provide uh, healthcare, then it's very difficult to provide family planning services. So um, the way forward is to provide better access to all healthcare. And uh, that's really a very big job, a global job for the nation. And uh, it's something each generation um, has to, to address, and we just have to do better on all fronts, and then the family planning will come with it. Totally echo this, uh, Professor Mola. The, uh, the primary healthcare, universal healthcare, is a bedrock for programs like uh, family planning, and uh, they can't exist in isolation. Totally agree. We also see this in tribal populations in India and other hard-to-reach communities. The the access access to healthcare is so vital. So, sir, uh, can you please enlighten us on the HIV? Uh, how big HIV is the challenge in Papua New Guinea and other sexually transmitted infections in India? The rate of HIV has come down, but Actually, transmitted infections continue to pose a huge challenge. So over to you. Yeah. It's the same in PNG. Um, I don't know whether HIV has actually come down in PNG, but it hasn't, uh, it's never risen steeply like it did in some parts of Africa. Uh, although uh, sexual um, behavior, as it were, um, is very similar to many African cultures. Um, so um, we have very high rates of uh, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis uh, infections. I think our chlamydia rates, which is a good proxy, of course, for um, the risk of um, of STIs, um, is runs at about 25%. Um, every time we do a survey, we seem to get somewhere between 23 and 26% in antenatal populations, in, in community surveys, um, in the STI clinics, of course, um, the chlamydia rates are over 30, approaching 40%. Um, syphilis rates are very variable. Um, in the highlands, they run at somewhere between 5 and 10% by rapid testing. That's the TPHA positivity, uh, which is a sort of historical positivity, isn't it? Because you never become negative again once you've become positive TPHA. Um, in the, in the uh, coastal areas, it's usually about 1% or 2%. Um, and gonorrhea um, is a very a tricky uh, disease. Trichomonas is another good proxy indicator of the risk of STIs. And depending on whether you use uh, wet preps or PCRs or these um, kind of technologies. Yeah. So we were about to talk about the HIV situation in Papua New Guinea. And um, we had our first, um, first positive uh, test, I should say, about 1987. And, uh, um, we, we seem to plateau in the national capital at about 2% several years ago because we had very intensive uh, community education programs in the, in the 2000s, in the early 2000s. But in the last three or four years, it, we've slowly climbed from 2% to 3%. Um, and because the emphasis seems to have gone off HIV, <laughs> there's so many other health issues to think about. and. Uh, um, So um, in rural areas, there are some communities, of course, with no HIV, and there are other communities where it's up to 10% positivity. Um, so it's quite a, a complex picture. Right, sir. Uh, okay. Can you also please uh, share your insights, sir, on how, on prevention aspects? Like, what more can be done in your experience on preventing transmission of HIV and other sexually transmitted infections? Thanks. Yeah. So, um, it's it's mainly young people, of course, who transmit these infections. Um, HIV is a little bit different, isn't it? Insofar as uh, you're much more likely to transmit if you have stay um, long long-standing multiple partners rather than just ephemeral occasional um, meetings of um, many partners. So 
So condoms, um, first of all, they need to be available in the community. All the health facilities hide the condoms away in their medical stores. So it's very difficult for people to get a condom. And um, by and large, people feel embarrassed about going to actually have to request a condom, especially as most of our health workers are women. And so difficult for young men to to go to a female health worker and request condoms. Um, and they don't, of course. They, um, if there's community distribution, it works so much better. And uh, uh, I, I preach uh, that the condom should be on the, the front reception desk of every health facility in an open box so that you can just uh, surreptitiously put your hand in the box and take what number you would like to put in your pocket. Um, some nurses get hung up on, oh, I have to record every condom that's distributed because it's a family planning method. And in the national health information systems, I have to record. No, you don't, I think. You don't. Just record that the condoms are gone. In fact, we don't record in the health information systems the names of the clients. We just record the numbers. So by all, <laughs> just record the condoms that disappear. It's fine. That's their being used, one hopes. Um, but it, it, it's, um, it's always an up, seems to be an uphill battle that um, there's an undercurrent or a feeling in, by health workers that condoms must be bad because they promote promiscuity or something. Uh, whereas they're required for promiscuity, you'd have to say. Promiscuity is there and, and the, the, the condoms just make it safer, that's all. And surely that's what we're into uh, as health workers. We're into safety and mitigation of risk. Um, but to get this message across seems to be quite difficult. When I, when I take my students on uh, what we call the community obstetrics uh, block, when they're undergraduates doing their ONG nine weeks clinical rotation, we spend one day distributing condoms. And uh, we take them to street markets. And uh, to, in the um, 10, 10, 15 years ago, it was very difficult to get the ladies sitting at the street markets to take the condoms for distribution. But now it's not difficult. Um, the community is now very aware of HIV as a problem. Um, and in fact, when we go to street markets, we're often mobbed by young, young men who want their supply of condoms before we give it to the ladies, because we give it to the ladies to sell, of course. They, they can sell at the, the free condoms at whatever the going rate is, the market rate, as it were. And they tell me that during the day, the market rate is very small, but at night, the market rate um, goes up. So they sell the condoms uh, to help their income. And as the condoms are all donated anyway, um, it's not as like our government's missing out by by distributing free condoms. So, but this needs to be done all over the country, not just in Port Moresby, the capital, but in other cities, towns, and of course, rural areas as well. So that, the, so that people never have to find a condom. Yeah, because when a boy or a girl needs to find a condom, they're not going to spend too much time doing that when... Um, the, the, the sex is around the corner, as it were. And uh, so just to get the condoms out into the community would be one of the best ways to, to uh, halt transmission of all sexually transmitted diseases. Right, right. Totally, totally echo what you have just said, Professor Mola, and all your very, very pragmatic and practical, uh, you know, uh, uh, approaches. Totally. And uh, great to see that these kind of uh, uh, approaches are working to, in Papua New Guinea. So, uh, Professor Mola, is antimicrobial resistance a challenge um, in, in, with respect to obstetrics, gynecology, resistance to antibiotics, antivirals, antifungal, antiparasitics, um, yeah. HIV in context of HIV, genital TB, yeah. uh, STIs? So, yeah. over to you, sir. Yes, yes. So, it's certainly it's a very big problem in TB um, in the last five years. Um, we had no drug resistance, about five resistance uh, um, are quite high. And even we're now getting um, 
multi or um, what's it called X X X resistance like to more than two drugs. Um, and this is a big. I mean, this is almost impossible for us to handle because we can't afford the second line and third line um, uh, drugs that are used for multi-drug resistant TB. And it's all because people after diagnosis are not compliant with their treatment you know if when you get diagnosed with tb and you're a bit you don't you sick and you've lost weight and then you take the drugs and within a month or two if you've got a sensitive um, infection then you feel so much better and you put weight on and within three months you feel as though you're entirely well by and large unless you've got organ damage um and so many people stop the medicine when they get to that point, but the few remaining microbacterium that you have in your body at this time are, of course, resistant. They're partial. That's why they're still there at uh, three months. And to get rid of those last few, it seems, with the collaboration of your own immune system um, is to take the full six or nine months treatment. And that's how we've bred the resistance, that people are stopping the medicine as soon as they feel well. Uh, and this, is all, this all comes down to um, uh, counseling and health education, of course. And doctors are so good at diagnosis, but they're pretty hopeless at counseling and getting people to comply with their, with their longer treatments. Um, and how, how to handle this, it's very difficult. I mean, in, in my department, when we diagnose TB in a pregnant woman, which is almost every day, I'd have to say, we, we keep them in the ward, start the treatment and make sure they don't react adversely to it with um, allergies or bad um, reactions of any kind, but also for the purpose of convincing them that can, they're going to take the full nine months treatment. Our, our protocol is with pregnancy, it's nine months, not six months. And we get them to recite. It's almost like a brainwashing exercise, or we get them to recite every day the name of their illness, because lots of people believe in bad spirits and um, witchcraft and, and TB being a very sort of uh, surreptitious uh, disease that is slowly progressive is easily branded as witchcraft. Um, so we get them to recite, uh, what's the name of your disease? I've got TB. And then how many months do you have to take the medicine to get rid of your TB properly? I have to take it for six months. And then the final question is, if you, when you take your medicine, you'll feel well in about two or three months. If you stop the medicine when you feel well, what's going to happen? And at that point, they have to say, my TB will come back and I will die. And at that point, of course, we say, are you going to die or are you going to take your phone? And they laugh a bit and we shake their hands. And they say this over and over again every day. It's part of the... <laughs> The mantra, as it were, that um, we that we go through with our with our women, but in the medical wards they don't do this. They just put the uh, patients on the drugs, and they the doctors leave the patient now in the hands of the nurses. And the nurse says, "Oh, you're on your drugs now. Just go and get your supply at the local clinics after one month or something. Bye bye." And uh, of course, they feel well, stop their medicine, and that's how we got the drug resistance with HIV. It's also very difficult. It's a much more chronic disease, even than TB, of course. And so the resistance is slower. But um, we have so many women come back to our antenatal clinics in the next pregnancy who took the antiretrovirals until the baby stopped breastfeeding. And then we lose contact with them in the maternity service. And then they stop the drugs and they come back with another pregnancy about two, three, four years later, and they haven't been taking the drugs for the last three years or something. And then we're starting them back on the drugs again. And who knows at this point whether, whether um, our treatment's going to be effective next time around. We're, we're seeing some cases which don't seem to get better. We have very little capacity to test for resistance of HIV. Mm.
And sir, what about sexually transmitted infections? Are they becoming difficult to treat because of resistance, uh, resistant germs, or uh, like antibiotics used in cesarean and other procedures? Are it are this causing yeah, a problem? Syphilis is still completely. Yes, indeed. So uh, syphilis is universally sensitive to penicillin still, which is fantastic. Um, but gonorrhea has become um, very resistant. I think we're on the third, the third iteration of a standard protocol for our, our gonorrhea infections. I think we're now using keftriaxone. Um, we, we started off with amoxicillin of uh, penicillins, and then we added augmentin, um, clavulinic acid, and then we went on to spectin and mycin, I think, and now we're on to uh, keftriaxone. Um, and of course, the gonorrhea bug is very smart, it seems, and it will become resistant to keftraxin in the, in the near future. So, yeah, it's a, it's a problem. Um, I really can't comment about chlamydia because we have no capacity to test, test for chlamydia. chlamydia. We just treat people assuming they've got it if they have other STIs. Right. 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 And uh, um, so a a any uh, additional uh, uh, insights you have on how to, uh, you know, help curb this rising antimicrobial resistance? Uh, uh, and and before before you answer, yeah. sir, I, I must compliment you, salute you for the kind of mantra which you are doing for you know, women with tuberculosis in your wards. I really, yeah. This is the first time ever we have I've heard from anyone who is doing like this. So real, very sincere respect. Well, my fa own family had uh, gone through tuberculosis um, and, and oh. never ever we have seen anyone counseling on this aspect, which is so, so important, sir. So thank you so much for doing it. And I will definitely yeah. try to yeah. spread this. Over to you about uh, how to, how can, <laughs> what, how can we curb AMR? Over to you. Yes. So um, antimicrobial resistance, I mean, it, it's a very difficult thing because people want antibiotics and um, junior health workers or um, um, lower countries feel as though they have, um, <laughs> like they have capacity if they can prescribe antibiotics. And and the patient expects antibiotics. And if you please the patient, then you're thought to be a good health worker. Uh, and so how to stop people just giving antibiotics for everything? Uh, and it's really very, we have standard protocols. You know, we have women coming to the gynecology clinic with say anovulatory dysfunctional bleeding and the health centers put them on antibiotics before they, I mean, what on earth are you doing for someone with? and ovulatory bleeding on antibiotics. And uh, uh, the, how to stop people just putting everything on antibiotics? Uh, I suppose you know, we have some protocols to give prophylactic antibiotics, like all our cesareans, all our hysteric prophylactic antibiotics. And so I suppose some health workers get, get the idea that if I give antibiotics, for everything, I'll get a better outcome or something. Um, because we, we know that's not true. <laughs> and uh, how to be more um, targeted. How to be more targeted with the prescription of antibiotics. And how to say no when the mother says, oh, shouldn't my baby have antibiotics when they've got a viral infection or something and and that's and it seems to be quite tricky some health workers have a, have difficulty um because injections work better doctor and then how to say no actually injections don't usually always work better it's better if you treat the disease um according to the needs of the disease rather than just giving everyone an injection uh, this is um, sometimes quite um, like it's sophisticated, I suppose, in a way, um, the counseling necessary. And of course, the health worker has to have confidence that they are right, that your baby does not need antibiotics, because if they're wrong and the, the baby comes back more sick with a bacterial infection, of course, then the health worker is going to be blamed for not giving the antibiotics when uh, the baby came last week or something. So. It's a very 
tricky thing. And um, we're at the point, of course, we, we can't afford, we're a low income country, so we can't afford the latest antibiotics, the ones that are not yet generic. So we just have to do our best with what we've got and do it do it properly <laughs> do it according to our pro just follow our protocols please that's my that's what i always say to health workers we've got the standard protocol books you follow the protocols and you'll be doing the right thing right totally totally agree with you like you know responsible and rational use of uh, all medicines is so key <laughs> professor mula uh, what about non communicable diseases um, are they uh, impacting uh, gynecological and obstetric care in, in Papua New Guinea? Mm, yes. I mean, in urban areas, we have an epidemic of obesity and metabolic diseases now. It's, it's all started to become so obvious to us in the last five years. Um, uh, it's, it, I mean, because I've been practicing for quite a long time, it's, I just think it's, it's not so long ago, we had almost no obesity and no better. I, when I was a registrar, I can remember presenting a case at the hospital grand round of diabetes and pregnancy because it was such a rare, I think for the year we had five cases or something out of 10,000 women. <laughs> but now we, we, have, we have women with um, impaired glucose tolerance and diabetes gestation or, or pregnant when they're already diabetic, you know, the whole spectrum of, of severity of uh, impaired um, glucose metabolism. I mean, every day we're admitting people to the antenatal ward for glucose profiles and um, um, st starting on treatment and, and stabilizing them. It's one of the commonest reasons for admission to the antenatal ward now. And so it's really been a very big change. And of course, if you get pregnant with diabetes, then you're very likely to have vascular damage already because of the long-standing um, condition. And then you, so you're getting pregnant on top of um, like <laughs> the arteries in your heart are not very good. <laughs> the arteries in your kidney and your brain are possibly damaged. And uh, this can be so very dangerous um, sort of, being tipped over into a gestational um, diabetes sort of situation means that you probably haven't got any vascular damage. And as long as we manage this pregnancy right, um, everything will be okay. But getting pregnant when you're already diabetic is so very, very dangerous. And um, then they get preeclampsia on top of their on top of their metabolic problems. And these are not first pregnancy women usually, are they? I mean, these are women who are getting on into their 30s. Um, and so they're, they're getting preeclampsia in an unexpected pregnancy, one of our indicators of the, the likelihood of uh, having uh, glucose tolerance issues. If, if we get someone with preeclampsia who, who um, is in their 30s and they haven't had preeclampsia before. And so all these things are all these... Um, Lifestyle diseases, um, non-communicable diseases, are being uh, a very serious issue for us in the urban areas of our country. In the rural areas, thankfully, um, except for, for a couple of provinces, um, village people are by and large are still unaffected by um, obesity and metabolic problems. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Mola. And uh, as you know, the International Conference on Family Planning will be opening next week in Thailand. Uh, so your message for uh, the ICFP 2022. Yes. yes. Um, so, <laughs> so please don't let up with assistance for us all in low and middle income countries with regards um, family planning and sexual reproductive health. Um, it's something that our national governments uh, don't seem to think is a priority. And the only way we struggle on to, to have any chance of providing reasonable sexual reproductive health and, and, and family planning services is with the support of um, the rest of the world. So uh, we're very much hoping that uh, 
um, President Biden stays in there, <laughs> and uh, that uh, differed in the United Kingdom and all these uh, the international air CEDA in Sweden and the Netherlands and all these other uh, donors and the, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, of course, which has become a major player in the family planning area, uh, that they keep their focus. They keep their focus on this really important issue, which is so important for women's rights, women's opportunities, women's education, uh, the, the status of women in, in uh, uh, their societies, the fact that they're not pregnant all the time, that they actually have a life, as well as being um, uh, the way that we have our families. Uh, it's so important. Please um, keep keep up the focus on these issues um, in the support to the low and middle income world, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Glenn Mola. We are so grateful for uh, you know for you to find your time despite your busy schedule. And uh, I'm, I'm also grateful to uh, my stars that the internet worked at least reasonably. <laughs> so all the best, sir. Thank you so much. And thanks a lot for inspiring us. There are certain, several messages and uh, new new insights and learnings, a new way of looking at things, which um, um, you know I am co concluding this interview. And I will definitely try my level best to spread uh, you know these words. Thanks a lot, sir. And all the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye.